Go ahead. Sir. We're, we're on. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I'm sing loud so y'all can't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> you ready? Okay. Turn your eyes upon Because you know how I sing. Good morning. Good to see you again. Well, um, uh, have, before we get into the Sermon on the Mount again, I have a few, um, uh, just a few things I want to mention to you. Um, first of all, I'm, I want to, let's ask God's blessing. We'll get officially into this. Father, we thank you for each one who's here and who's watching by uh, internet, we ask you now your blessing, your inspiration, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask all of you for a favor. I'm going to ask you all to pray that God will give me a fresh anointing on those radio broadcasts. I've been doing them for years and years. And recently, in the last several months, I have noticed that I just don't sound right. And uh, I, I told uh, Janetta, she is one person who listens almost every single week, and I said, I said, have you noticed how bad that's sounding? She said, that sounds like you. Not very complimentary, but... Uh, but no, I said, uh, it sounds just like you, and it doesn't sound bad. I said, tell them all that I said. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I, I thought about calling the radio station and said, there's something wrong with your tape player. It sounds horrible. Now, either I'm becoming more relaxed in my delivery as I get older, or... Uh, or something wrong with their tape recorder. So I'm listening to that, and I think, and she said, no, that's how you really sound. I thought, okay. And the other people, the tape recorders, the, the minister sounded normal. And the guy last week, I went up and put some, brought some more tapes up there. He said, well, we are our own worst critic. And I said, yeah, but it just sounds terrible. So what I'm going to ask all of you to do is pray for me to have a fresh new anointing. Also, I've been trying to update. Now, we're going to get into the Sermon on the Mount in just a few minutes, but I want to just make, make a few uh comments about our radio program i am going to try to change my delivery just a bit one of the things i do is i when i do my radio program i sit in my recliner and i'm comfortable and i think i sound too relaxed on radio uh, <clears throat> when i started on radio some years ago i was also hired as an as a disc jockey as a radio announcer and um, the uh, program director came to me one day and he was he didn't like the way i sounded he, he said, when I listen to your radio program, and I, when I first started, man, I was all excited. I'm gung-ho and all this, and I think we need to be that way about the days that we're living in. But he said, when I hear you in the radio program, you sound good. But he said, when you're doing the announcing, he said, you sound like you just don't give a darn. He didn't say darn. But anyway, that was the gist of it. Uh, and I'm using a, a euphemism there, but... I said, I was stunned. I was astonished. I said, I don't, I sound like I don't care. I said, no, I'm trying to do my best. But one of the things that I learned in broadcast journalism in college out, out in Southern California is that you must use voice inflection. And I knew that when I first started, but then I kind of got relaxed and developed more of a conversational tone of voice, which may sound good across the table when you're having coffee with somebody or sitting in the living room talking, <coughs> but it doesn't sound good on radio. So I am asking God for a fresh anointing on this radio program, and I'm asking you to pray that God will give me that because I believe God will hear your prayers. Um, so I'm, I'm excited about the Bible, but my listeners may not think I'm excited. Now, I learned something in sales. I used to do sales a lot years ago. 
I was always in sales, it seems like, and one of the things they teach you in selling is, if you are not excited about your product, nobody else will be. If you're not convinced that your product is a good product, why would they buy it? So you have to be excited about your product or they won't be. And you may be excited, but if you don't sound excited, you don't really want to buy this vacuum cleaner, do you? No, I don't. And uh, I never was successful selling vacuum cleaners. In fact, I never sold a single one. <laughs> I never sold a one. <clears throat> In fact, uh, before God healed me of asthma, I had an asthmatic attack on my very first demonstration because I had all the dust and everything in the vacuum cleaner. So <clears throat> one of the things that I have done, I got on the internet this week and I was listening to Art Gilmore. Now, for those of you who are too young to remember, Art Gilmore was the voice of Hollywood in the 1960s, all the way back to the 40s, I would guess. He was the voice. He was, he's, he's the one who did the trailers on the movies. In fact, uh, if, you, if you've ever listened to Turner Broadcasting, Tr Channel 25, the uh, TMC, TMC Turner, Turner, was, Classic. Turner Classic Movies, if you've ever watched the trailers that they have on there, you'll hear Art Gilmore's voice. And uh, he, he did over 2,700 movie trailers. He just died eight years ago at the age of 98. I went on the internet, just looked him up a little bit. He did movie trailers for Roman Holiday. He did it for Disney. He did it for South Pacific. He even did it for White Christmas. He's advertising. Everybody's probably seen White Christmas. Bye Bye Birdie. He uh, did the trailer for It's a Wonderful Life. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yep. You heard of it? It's a Wonderful Life. And they actually quoted here in this uh, article what he said. Uh, never before has any film contained such a full measure of the joy of living. I doubt he wrote that, but the way he would say it, he had this voice. Let me read this one paragraph here. It said, Mr. Gilmore was an especially effective pitch man delivering the language of hype with masterful conviction. Uh, it said, his voice, crisp and articulate, just a tad piercing, uh, cagely pitched to the subject matter and inflected with a precisely calibrated measure of enthusiasm. That's, that's what I've been lacking in my radio programs. So for several months, I have been listening to myself and thinking, who would listen to that? And so I got on the internet and I was listening to all these various trailers that Art Gilmore did. It, does anybody still not know who Art Gilmore is? You remember the Red Skelton show, for those of you who are old enough? He announced Red Skelton. He would say, now, Red Skelton. And then at the end, he would say, this is Art Gilmore speaking. He'd always say that. Uh, I remember one time they actually showed his picture there and he had white hair. When I met Art Gilmore, he had dark hair. Thought, how's that happen? He must have dyed his hair. He's a big, tall fellow. But um, I had a chance to meet him some years ago and ask him some questions. I don't remember all the questions I asked him. I had a chance to meet him with just a few people, three or four people. And uh, so uh, I only remember one question that I asked him. I asked him if he enjoyed doing what he did. But Art Gilmore made the statement. He said, he, he said I had somebody to come up to me and say, Oh, I recognize your voice from your from your uh, announcing. He said, no, you don't. He said, my voice that I do when I'm announcing is totally different than my conversational voice. And see, that's, you gotta learn from the best. Art Gilmore was absolutely the best. He was, they have, uh, every year they give out Art Gilmore Achievement Awards for radio broadcasting. So I'm trying to remember what Art Gilmore said, uh, what he said to me, what I heard him say that day when I met him about how that you, you got to sound excited on radio. So who I, what I'm going to ask you to do, it's not enough for me just to have a more excitable delivery when I'm on radio. It's also important for God to anoint me. And I want you to pray that God will anoint me and anoint the listeners who hear me. Because if God doesn't anoint them either, then it's not going to work. No matter how good you might be on radio, if God isn't working behind the scenes and anointing the people, it's not going to work. Uh, maybe after the service today, some of you can gather around, have just one person, whoever would like to do it, to pray, and the others just be in agreement. Just lay hands on me and ask God to anoint me. I'm very serious about this. You know, I, I told you last week, the temple is now ready to be built. I went into that very thoroughly. They've got everything ready to go. Do you really think it's going to be another 100 or 200 years before they build the temple? Everything is ready to go right now. Gershon Solomon, the head of the Temple Mount Faithful in Israel, said, he told me, he said, we are going to build it. And I said, when? He said, we don't know. And they don't know. And I'm not setting dates. But they're ready to go. Do you know the only thing they don't have is the Ark of the Covenant? In March, I think it was three years ago now, March, I believe it was, they finished the last piece of furniture. Everything is ready. A man told me back when I was in my early 20s, he was a Jewish man, he said, 
you know, they, they've got to change the calendar, but they have to have a new Sanhedrin to do that. And to rebuild the temple, they need a new Sanhedrin. A new Sanhedrin <coughs> was formed in Israel in 2004, and they officially started in January of 2005. Now, what I'm telling you is this. Everything is now ready. Do you really think we're going to go two or three or four more generations before they actually build that thing? Jesus said, when you see these things come to pass, this generation, the one that sees this, shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. The great tribulation in one generation. The heavenly signs, the day of the Lord, and the second coming of Christ, and the setting up of the kingdom of God. I'm not setting dates, but I'm telling you, if they start rebuilding that temple soon, within 10 years, you're going to be in Jerusalem in a glorified body with Jesus Christ, and he will have you to stand before his judgment seat and give an account. So that's why we want to get people excited. We could be in the last decade before Christ returns. We could be. The last 10 years before he comes back. I don't know. But I don't think it's going to go another 30 or 40 or 50 years. It doesn't look like it, so we do want to do that. So anyway, I want to share that with you. Um, but I want to learn from the best, and I've listened to a lot of his trailers and just trying to say, now, what made him so good? But he, he said that day I met him, he said, the way I talk, just you know, one on one like this, he said, if I did this, you know, nobody would listen to what I got to say. You know, nobody's going to listen to that. So, uh, you pray for me. Please pray for me. <clears throat> we want to reach a lot more people. Are there any uh, questions or any thoughts anybody has before we get into the Sermon on the Mount today? Yes, sir. I don't see how it can last another 10, 20 years. Yeah. Because of world conditions now. <coughs> Excuse so, me. So much adverse weather conditions, so much crime and fires. Yeah, it may not. I don't. It does make you wonder how could it go another twenty years? Yes. I have a comment about all that. Oh, on, on there. Okay. On, uh, um, my personal comment. Oh, you got a personal comment. Okay. I've been listening to your radio show every day for sixteen years. Mm -hmm. Every time it's on for sixteen years. Mm -hmm. So nobody's probably heard it more than I have. Yeah, it's probably true. <laughs> the rest of them won't listen. Well, what I'm saying is, you sound great on the radio. <laughs> I think you're. Again, your own worst critic, because mm -hmm. you know full well that I would tell you if I thought something was wrong. You know yeah. I would. And I, if you want to change it up, I'm all for that. And you do need God's anointing when you record it. Absolutely. But you need to have some confidence, too, because confidence shows in your voice. And you're so hard on yourself mm -hmm. that you need to have a little more confidence in how you sound and in your delivery. Well, when I start seeing the fruits and more and more people calling in, I'll have but <laughs> more like, like we've said before, you don't know how many people you're reaching that never call. Well, that's true. The lady I met yesterday said she'd been listening frequently, and that's the first time I knew that. Exactly. And, and what did Carl Ford tell you? That a lot of preachers that listen to your show say they listen to your show. No, that's right. Yeah. So there's uh, a lot of people listening. They may not call, but you're reaching people. You just may not you see it. I agree with her. Absolutely. And who is the prince of the air that has told you that? I will be wrong. It could be. Could be. Uh, Nathan. Well, does anybody else complain about how you say I'm No. Nobody, nobody else says. Yes. Okay, Mr. Complainer. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I got a question for you guys. Do you listen to my radio program? Yes, I do. One person. Yes. No, I got a, what's the radio station number? Uh, let's see. You live here. 1140 and 1460 on AM. The best one is 1460. That's the easiest one to hear. 1460 AM. For those at watching one by. At 1 o'clock on Sundays, Eastern Time. Yeah, 1 o'clock Eastern Time. And for those of you watching by live stream, you can pick it up over the internet. By the way, that thing has slipped again. And, and if you watch it. it on, if you watch it online, make sure that you turn your pop-up blockers off. And the address is www.fordbroadcasting.com. Turn your pop-up pop, pop, pop up blocker, blocker off. off, and then you'll be able to uh, to hear it. But if they want to listen on Saturday mornings at ten o'clock before church starts, they can listen on WHVN. I think it's. 1240 on the AM, 104.3 FM, and... Uh, I think their website is heavenradio.org, <coughs> or if you Google WHVN, you can listen live on their website, too. Yeah. <coughs> and they do have five minutes of news before my program, so my program doesn't start at 10, it starts at about 10.05. <coughs> Any other comments, questions? Yes, sir. Different note, what is a sermon? What is a sermon? Well, it's a... Uh, it's a little different than teaching. What I do mostly here is teaching, but uh, sermon is where you use expository t teaching, really, as opposed to 
preaching. A sermon is preaching when you're doing an expository type message. There's a comment and a question. And then mind. teaching is more like where you go through. Like I'm going to be, today I'm going to be teaching going through the Sermon on the Mount. I think that would be better. Yeah, what's comment the comment? Comment and a question. Randy, in Canada, who listens online, says that you are reaching lots of people on, on the Internet, and he's in Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada. Mm -hmm. So you're reaching people. And then there's a question. Okay. Oh, and you know, he even has posted the link to poor broadcasting mm -hmm. to all his friends in Canada. Good. Well, and I want to make sure when they hear me, they don't say, no, oh, start yawning. Look at that yank up here. <laughs> yeah. Question. Okay, what's the question? I don't understand why you say that the sermon is only for disciples when it says in that the mass was stunned of his teaching. It doesn't say the mass. It doesn't use that word. It says, uh, it says the people. It doesn't say the mass. There was no mass. It says the people were astonished at his teaching. That's the last verse in chapter 7. Oh. Yeah. And the reason we know it was only for the disciples, is, that's a good segue into the message here. The reason we know it was only for the disciples is because Matthew chapter 13, I think it's about verse 34, says, Without a parable spoke he not to them, the multitudes, the masses, he always spoke in parables. But the Sermon on the Mount is just plain teaching. Okay, let's get into, good, good question. Let's get into chapter 6. Was that a ministry who asked that question? No, it was one of the guys that watched, watches online. Okay. Chapter, let's go to chapter 6 of Matthew. That's what we're starting today. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Matthew 6. You know, last week we went into what the Bible said about divorce and remarriage and went into that quite thoroughly. Uh, and since these are archived, if anybody missed that, you can go back and catch that and answer a lot of your questions you've had about it. Chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not your alms. Don't do your alms before men. Now, what are alms? Well, it's charitable giving. It's charitable acts. Uh, some people describe it as righteous acts. But you're doing something good for people. You're blessing people. Mostly you're, you consider it as charity, giving to the poor, for example. Don't do it to be seen of men. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father in heaven. Uh, now, again, we talked when we were in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. It sounds like a contradiction. So let me just reiterate that just a bit. Verse 16 of chapter 5, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Now, what's the difference? That sounds like a contradiction. What Jesus is saying is don't hide your light, but don't do your alms for the express purpose so that people will say, ooh, ain't he or she a good Christian? Oh, look how wonderful they are. And you're sitting back like a cat purring under all this exultation. They're, you're exulting in it. You know, oh, this is, feels so good. If you're doing it to be seen of men, your, your, your motive is wrong. If that's what you want, that's what you'll get. So if you're asking to be seen of men, you'll be seen of men. But if you want God to reward you, and he'll give you a lot better reward than that, then don't do it with that motive. Do it with one motive. And 1 Corinthians 13 says do it with the motive of love. He said, if I give all my goods, all my goods to the poor, but I don't do it out of charity. The Greek word is agape, a divine love. It profits me nothing. There is a profit that God will give you, a reward, if you'll do what you do in love. So anytime you help people, do it in love. In fact, let me just digress for just a moment. Uh, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago where there was a, a boy that uh, his parents needed to take him to Houston, Texas to have special surgery. He's got a, some kind of serious perhaps fatal problem, and they said he needed surgery, but he had to go to Houston to do it. And uh, this was at our reunion, my family reunion on my mother's side, and they were asking for people could just give some love offerings to help them with the expenses, because it's gonna cost a lot to go down there. And uh, I said, I'm not gonna just pull out a 10 or $20 bill out of my pocket, I'm gonna write them a check, but I didn't have a checkbook. So I told him, I said, I wanna give you something to help you, but I, got, I, I don't have a checkbook with me. So I did that purely out of love. I wasn't even thinking, well, now God's gonna reward me. Here lately, I've been saying, uh, boy, I need to file cabinets. I think I've told you this before, so I'll make it very brief, but maybe not everybody's heard it. And I have found recently, in the last few weeks, three file cabinets, like new, sitting on the side of the road for somebody to pick up. Does that count the one we just picked up? Yeah, that's amazing. In fact, she was with me. She's a, uh, a witness on that third one. She was actually in the car with me, and I said, that looks like another file cabinet. 
Went out there, sure enough, with another file cabinet. And I've been asking, well, I didn't actually pray about it. Remember, we haven't got to this yet. In chapter 6, verse 33, if you'll seek first God's kingdom, these things will be added. You don't even necessarily have to pray for them. Now, I needed some file cabinets. The first one's sitting right in there now. That's much better than what we had last year. The one we had before is beat up and bent. And yeah, the one we had before is all beat up and bent. That's at my house now. So, so God knew what I needed. Now, that file cabinet there has enough room to put first and second year all the folders that I've been having to put in different places. It's all there. When I saw that thing, it's not beat up or, or anything, and I said, man, if that just had a key because it's got a lock, it'd be like brand new. I got home and looked, sure, there's the key, all right. So it's like brand new, and I got it for free. You God see what, knows what we need before yeah. we need. God knows what we need, but we, we sow the seed. People say, well, why doesn't God do that for me? Have you sown any seed? Have you blessed other people? Have you loved other people? Have you helped other people? Are you giving to people who are in need, or are you stingy? See, when God sees you do that, Paul says if you do it out of love, not to be seen a man, but if you do it out of love, there's profit. There's a reward. I asked for, I just, I didn't even pray about it. I just said, I need a file cabinet. I need one. I need one. I got to get me one. And I'm too lazy to go down to the store, and I don't have time to go down there to get it. So I've been walking down the road with my dog, and I see that thing, and I said, well, there's a file cabinet exactly like I wanted. And I thought one would be enough. God gave me two more. Didn't have to pay for it. So that's what I'm saying. God sees your works and he will reward you. Any questions on verse 1? Yes, sir. The Bible says that you bring our tithes into the storehouse and make meat in the Lord's house. You open up a wind in heaven and pour us out a blessing that we don't yeah. have room to receive. If we're consistent in honoring God with our tithe, and, it's, and, and that's a good point, and it's not just turning loose of 10%, it's to, see, tithing is an act of worship. I tell people, lay your hands on that check, write the check, lay your hands on that check, get on your knees and worship God, say, Lord, thank you for how you've blessed me, and then pray two prayers. This is what I do. I ask you to bless the ministry that this is going to, and bless me with a harvest on my giving. Those things are already there. Yeah, they're waiting for you. For you. Exactly. That's what Peter said, yeah. Verse 2, therefore, when you do your alms, your charitable giving, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that, for this reason, that they may have glory of men. Verily, truly, I say to you, they have their reward. That's it. That's all they're going to get. They got their reward. When I was in college, there was this guy, uh, I still remember his name, but I won't mention it just in case he's listening. But anyway, he was a student there uh, where I was attending at that time in Texas. And he was, he was a cut up. And we had just heard a sermon or something about don't blow the trumpet, don't sound the trumpet, you know, when you're getting ready to do something. So he went around in our dormitory to everybody, every room. He said, hey, guys, I'm getting ready to pray. Do y'all need anything? Hey, guys, I'm getting ready to pray. Just want to let you know. Anybody need anything? And we were laughing at him because he was just doing that because we just heard a sermon. Don't go around telling people you're praying, you know. It's not wrong to let people know, but the Bible says pray in secret. But he was a cut up. Never forgot that. Of course, I guess that's not bad to say, do you need anything? When you do your alms, verse 3, don't let your left hand know what your right hand does. Now, your left hand and your right hand are pretty close. You don't even have to tell your wife or your husband or your best friend what you're doing. That your alms may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret himself shall reward you openly. Don't be ashamed of your giving, but you have to be careful about your own heart. Am I doing this so that they will see me and think I'm righteous? Because that's the only reward I get. Or am I doing this because I really care for that brother? Where's the word openly? So he will reward you openly. Where's the root word of that? What is he saying? Well, if you pray in secret, he tells you to go into your closet and close your door, which means nobody knows you're even praying. Mm -hmm. And so you pray in secret, you ask in secret, you give in secret, or you don't make a big production out of it. And then openly means that where everybody can see the reward. Everybody will see that you're blessed. Yeah, the Greek Mm -hmm. To appear known. To appear known, yeah. That's what the Greek says. Okay, good. Thanks for looking that up. So openly, everybody will see that you're blessed. But when you pray, you shall not be as the hypocrites are. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets. Why? So everybody can see them. That they may be seen to men. Truly, I said to you, that's their reward. That's the only reward they're going to get. I remember I was... Uh, 
You know, there's also a scripture here where it says don't don't pray long prayers out of pretense. I don't know what where that is. I know it's on the right page, but I don't know what chapter it's in. I might be able to find it if I look real close here. But uh, let me see if I can find it here. I just happen to think of it right now. I know it's also in Luke. But anyway, uh, he says some people pray out of pretense. He says don't do that. Um, this lady, uh, I, I visited a church when I was a kid. I was probably a teenager. And the pastor asked this lady if she would pray and open up the service. She got down on her knees and, and she got down beside the pew and she started just to pray and, the, and she got louder and louder and louder and she started hollering and screaming and yelling and, and uh, this is my first time at that church and my cousin had invited me and I told my cousin, I said, man, she was really, really in earnest. Is she having problems? Or she said, oh, she does that every week. So that's just the way she prayed. Be careful. Now, it's not wrong to get excited in your prayer, but make sure you're not being theatrical. Make sure you're not doing it to put on a show. Because if you put on a show, then that's your reward. Don't, don't do that. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. Now, the word closet doesn't mean a clothes closet. It means a small room. Yes, sir. Going back to that word openly, mm -hmm. the Lord loves to show off his grace and his mercy and his goodness to yep. us where the rest of the world can see. And if they see that, then they'll want to know where it comes from. Yeah. And he doesn't then need you can, us help Then me. you can uh, yeah. be a witness and tell yeah. people where your goodness comes from, yeah. and they might want to follow you, you know, yeah, follow absolutely. God. Are you following Now people won't, you know, the best way to, as it says in the book of uh, Philemon, that, you, that you're the witnessing, the sharing of your faith may be effective by the, by the good. In other words, when you show people what Christ has done in your life, it makes your witnessing effective. The last thing you want to do is be trying to witness to somebody. You need to be a Christian like me. And they look at you and say, why would I want to be like you? You're the most cursed person I know. Nothing works for you. You're sick. God, your, your God doesn't heal you. Uh, nothing works for you. You can't, you know, you're going hungry. Why would I want to be a Christian to be like you? But if you can say, look how Christ has blessed me. Look how he's healed me. Look what he's done for me. Look at it. And start sharing that with people. Then they say, well, whatever you've got, I want it. I want that blessing. So enter into your closet when you pray, and God will reward you openly, he says. Your father who sees the secret, verse 6, will reward you openly. Now, is it wrong to pray in church? No. Jesus prayed before his disciples. It's not wrong to have an opening prayer or to have a closing prayer or, or whatever. That's okay. It's not wrong at Thanksgiving time if somebody calls on you to pray. Go ahead and pray over the dinner. 1 Corinthians 14 talks about that. How can they say amen at your giving of things if they don't know what you're saying? So pray in English. But, but the point being, uh, it's okay to pray in front of others. Jesus did it himself. But if you're going to have a long prayer, do it in secret. When I was a kid, I went to the United Methodist Church, and we had, every four years, they changed pastors. And we had one pastor that would pray for 10 minutes, and sometimes 15 minutes, a quarter of an hour. I know I, I used to time him every, every week. I'd time him. And I heard one lady say after church, she said, I wish our pastor would do his praying before he came to church. I heard her say that. She was one of the Sunday school teachers there. In fact, she was the daughter of one of the past pastors there one of the former pastors, I wish he'd do his prayer before he came to church. And those elderly people sitting out there with their heads bowed for 15 minutes, I think half of them were asleep by the time he said amen. I mean, it's hard to keep your, your head down for 15 minutes. I, I don't even want to do that. So if, you, if you're going to pray a long prayer, if you want to pray all night, by all means, go for it. Jesus did, but he did it in private. He didn't pray all night in front of his disciples. He did it in private. So pray as long as you want to when you're behind closed doors. But when you're like in a public place like this, my prayer is 15 seconds and I say amen. Yes, sir. Jesus prayed for an hour and the disciples went to sleep. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, the night of his crucifixion. But even then he went over there by himself and prayed yeah. and they went to sleep that night. <clears throat> yes. Well, <clears throat> Jesus is looking at the at what the average most people get up and walk out. Some will. 
You could try that in the church, and most people will say, all right, I'm gone. I'm out of here. <clears throat> people have a very short attention span these days, <clears throat> especially the kids who grow up with video games have a very short attention span. <clears throat> so do your praying mostly in private. Some people go to church to pray. Don't come here to pray. Pray at home. Come here to fellowship and come here to let's study the word of God and let's, let's worship God. Now, he said in verse 7, when you pray, but when you do pray, don't use vain repetitions. He didn't say don't use repetitions. He said don't use vain repetitions. Remember, Jesus prayed the exact same prayer three times in the Garden of Gethsemane. Repetition is not a sin because Jesus never sinned. Vain repetitions. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, blah, blah, blah. Our Father which art in heaven, let's see, I'll do that 20 times now, that way God will hear me. Uh-uh. Try that with your, with your wife. Try that with your husband. It ain't going to work. If you pray one short prayer and you mean it sincerely, that means more to God than praying a hundred times. Yes, sir. Well, you know, praying in repetition sometimes, you might need the same thing every day. And you're praying it from the heart. That's right. That's not vain. That's not vain. I pray the same thing every day. I, I do too. I have a certain prayer I pray at night. I pray the same thing, but every time I pray it, I mean it. It's not, yeah, it's right. not just a bunch of meaningless so like, words. Like the Catholics praying the rosary. That's yeah. You got all these beads. When you come to that bead, you say this prayer. When you come to this bead, you say another prayer. Yes, sir. I'm kind of concerned about that because I say my prayers every day. A lot of it is just the same thing I said. You know, I'm praying for somebody. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing I pray three or four days. Ago. Yeah. But you mean it when you pray it, though. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Before you ask the question, hold that. Let me say this. When I was a kid growing up, the way I learned the Lord's Prayer is we said it every Sunday, every Sunday, every Sunday, and I wasn't even paying attention to what I was praying. That's vain repetition. I pray the same. I pray halfway to work every morning because I've got such a long commute, so I get a lot of praying done in the car, and I pray them the same thing every, just about every time, mm -hmm. and I mean it, but. <clears throat> God doesn't need me to remind him every time what my petitions are. So, I mean, should I ask, pray the same thing every day? I mean, God doesn't have Alzheimer's. No, he doesn't. We should, we should pray that we understand and know what to pray for. Amen. Yeah. Yes. We should ask God then, to help us But would that show a lack of faith on my part? Not necessarily, because in Luke 18, he said that men ought always to pray and not to faint, to give the example of the woman because of her importunity. Even an unjust judge gave her what she wanted. Her importunity, she kept asking until they came. Yes, sir. Well, you know, the Bible says that we're supposed to pray without ceasing. Yeah. And then, you know, that's the reason why Jesus told us how to say that prayer. Yeah. Because that's a prayer that covers everything. Yeah. I heard Charles Stanley years ago, he said... <coughs> Let's say that you prayed everything you could think to pray, and you prayed for a whole hour last night, and tonight you come before God and you think, I don't have anything to pray. So you say, hey, Lord, remember what I said last night? Ditto, Lord. <laughs> there it is. Took care of all of it. <laughs> oh. Sometimes you got to do that, you know. <laughs> when you pray, don't use vain repetitions as the heathen do. Now, if you want to know what not to do, look at what the heathen do. Do you know that the Hindus have a rosary too? That's probably where the Catholics got it. The Hindus have a rosary. And they recite their prayers. And, and they also, I don't know if it's the Hindus or one of the other groups in, in India, but they put a prayer in a little box. They call it a prayer wheel. And they'll spin that thing around. And every time that thing goes around, it sends up a prayer to one of their gods. And they'll just sit there all day. That's vain repetition. Jesus said, now don't do what the heathen do. Don't do what the heathen do. Jeremiah 10 says, learn not the way of the heathen. Don't imitate them the way they worship their gods. Yes, sir. Well, just one more thing. Like Janetta was saying, she prayed the same prayer every time she get in her car. So do I. Yeah. Was up, you know, most of the time you're going the same way, yeah. but it might be different conditions. Sure. You know, it might be raining or snowing. Well, every time I get in the car, unless I just get busy, I try to, every time I get in the car, pray for, for protection. That's, That's not vain. <laughs> I mean it. I need God to protect me. The way I drive, I really need God to protect me. My little truck has got 287,000 miles on it, and I pray every time I've got it. Yep. I try to make a habit. I pray for, like like this morning, on the way here, I was praying for not only my protection, but I pray for everybody who came here this morning that God will protect. And there's not wrong praying that. Yes, sir. Well, when I get to my car, I put the key in the door. I said, Lord, this is your car. Please take care of me. Yeah. When 
I get a new car, I always dedicate it to God and say, Lord, I'll, let me use this some way to, to glorify you. <clears throat> Everything you have, you should use it to glorify God. Okay, so repetition is not wrong. It's vain repetition is wrong. Don't, verse 8, be not you therefore like unto them. Jeremiah 10, 1 says, don't learn the way of the heathen. Don't be like the heathen in any way, shape, or form. Don't celebrate their holidays. Don't pray the way they do. Don't have anything to do with the heathen. Leave them alone. Jeremiah 1. Jeremiah 10, verses 1 and 2. Don't learn the way of the heathen. For the customs of the people are vain. And then it gives you an illustration of one of the things they do. You can read the rest of that and find out what that is. <clears throat> then he says, for your father knows what you, <clears throat> excuse me, what you what you have need of before you ask him, as Billy mentioned back there a moment ago. God knows what you need. You don't have to just, like you said, he doesn't have Alzheimer's. Lord, you know I need this. I'm asking you. Now, James says you have not because you ask not. That was the brother of Jesus. Lord, you know I need a file cabinet. I didn't even pray about that. I could have said, Lord, give me one. But, uh, but you know, God knows you need food and clothing and shelter, so just ask him to provide it. And Jesus said, when you pray, believe you receive and you'll have. What's one that? of our folks watching online uh -huh. said in his French Bible, it says pagans. Pagans. Pagan and heathen are really the same thing. Pagan referred to the people living out in the country. But the heathen were those who worship. If you look it up in the dictionary, they were polytheistic. They worshiped many gods. And so are the pagans. After this manner, therefore, here's how you pray. Now, the first, now we need to look at this. Our Father. The Muslims are afraid of Allah. They don't love Allah. In fact, when you go and talk to, whether it be Muslims or, or Hindus, and you mention to them that you're a Christian and that you love God, they say, how do you love a God? small g how do you love a god because you see their gods according to first corinthians chapter 10 are demons and those demons are mischievous and they cause problems demons are worshiped by the heathen because they're ignorant and don't know any better do you really think it's a god a true god who would lead people to fly airplanes into the world trade center and kill nearly three thousand innocent people would any true god do that no but satan the devil would and Allah is another name for Satan the devil. Might as well tell you the truth. That wasn't the true God that led that airplane to those, both airplanes in the World Trade Center. That's not the true God telling people to put bombs, strap bombs on themselves and go out and blow up innocent people, including children. That's not the true God. See, I still like what Anne Grandma said about that. When somebody asked mm -hmm. her why God would let that happen, mm -hmm. and she said God didn't let that happen. The, the public has removed God from yeah. our school. Somebody asked, Am Graham Lotz is Billy Graham's daughter, if you didn't know. They asked her about when the Columbine incident occurred. They said, why did God let the, that shooting occur? She said, God's not in the schools. How was he going to prevent it? He threw him out. Yes, sir. The Bible says that we uh, pray and turn from our wicked ways. He'll heal our land. He'll heal our land. Second uh, Chronicles 7, 14. Yeah. So how do we address God? We don't now, now, we are to be God-fearing people, but the word fear there doesn't mean to be in terror. It means, like, I feared my father, but I loved my dad, but I feared him because if I didn't do what he said, he had a thick belt, and he was on, you know. The Bible says if you spare the rod, if you don't use corporal punishment, you hate your child, you know. My father loved me. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> I had a certain fear. <laughs> That if he said, you better do this, it's like, yes, sir. One time he asked me to sweep the porch. I never forgot it. And I said to him, I don't think it needs it. I had to say. But after I said that, I went into the hall closet. And I, was, I already had the broom in my hand. And he caught me in the hall. And he left welts on me. I couldn't sit down for a couple of hours, I don't think. I remember that to this day. He said, the next time I tell you to do something, you do it. It's like, yes, sir. My dad had a German temper. Now, Paul said in the book of Hebrews, if we reverence our human fathers, we give them reverence, how much more should we reverence the Father of lights? And, and I forget exactly how it's worded, but we should reverence the true God if we reverence our fathers. So we're to address God not in terror or in that kind of fear. We're not afraid of God, but in a reverential fear. We address God as our Father. Some people don't have a good relationship with their father, and that's hard for them to do, and I understand that. But a true godly father should be a loving father. That's how we're to approach God. 
Hallowed be thy name. The first thing we mention. Now we don't pray these exact words because then you could be using vain repetition. But the first thing we want to mention is God help me to respect and hallow your name. I've got a, a lesson, a class here that we do where we go through the Ten Commandments and I, I go through the Third Commandment where I show that how people are taking God's name in vain and don't even realize it. Some of the worst offenders are people like Joyce Meyer, Jesse Duplantis, Creflo Dollar, some of the faith preachers who will holler out the name of Jesus as a byword because they don't know what else to say at that moment. Now, if you want to say Buddha, 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 go for it. But don't say the name of our Savior that way. You're taking his name in a vain way. Vain doesn't mean just cursing. Vain means useless. People will say, oh, and then they'll holler out the name of God. Don't do that. Now, if you say, well, Keith, that's your opinion. You want to take the chance on that? You want to risk it? You need to start respecting the name of God. Any name for God, Almighty, God, Lord, Jesus, or Christ, any of those names, show respect for them. Because there's power in their name. There's power, yeah. <clears throat> the Bible says... <clears throat> oh, I know it. Yeah, and they'll holler out the name of the Savior like that as a byword. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> that's wrong because his name is so powerful and so holy that to use it as a byword uh, he's our father you know what, what? I've asked the husbands this sometimes in class what if I were to use your wife's name as a byword let's say your wife's name is Mary I, won't, I don't know your husband's name but I forget his name but anyway if I said oh Mary you'd say would you stop using my wife's name like that I don't appreciate that that's how God feels we shouldn't want to use his name as a Bible. Now, the world, the heathen do that. Be not like the heathen, because that's how the heathen are. It says, you mentioned the name of Jesus. It says, whosoever uh, mentions or uses the name of Jesus, let him depart from iniquity. To even say his name, you need to repent of sin. Don't even have sin. Don't be cursing and then, then also use his name. Don't even mix those two together. The name of Jesus is so holy. If we could just get a hold of that. And the name of God is so holy. So that's the first thing he mentions. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed means holy. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, if the kingdom of God is limited to a futuristic world ruling government, if I pray, Lord, bring your kingdom soon, is he going to do it sooner or is he not going to do it when he's good and ready to do it? Thy kingdom come. Let it be this year, Lord. No. God already has a set time when he's going to bring his kingdom. Well, why am I praying for his kingdom to come? Now, understand, the word kingdom in Greek is not limited to the four constituent parts that make up an actual, literal kingdom. Jesus said, they asked him, when will the kingdom come? He says, well, when it does come, it won't come with observation. The Greek says outward show. It's not something you see with your physical eyes. I know there will be a world ruling government at the second coming. But this says thy kingdom come, present tense. I want God's kingdom to come now in my life. Well, what is the kingdom of God? Uh, Romans 14, I believe it's verse 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. But what is it? But righteousness. That's the kingdom of God. Peace. Enjoy. That's what the kingdom of God is. I am not negating or, or nullifying the fact that Jesus is going to set up a literal kingdom. But Christ also emphasized a spiritual kingdom. The spiritual aspect. And that's what we're to pray for. God, I want your kingdom in my life. Thy kingdom come in my life. Righteousness in my life. Joy. I want peace in my life. That's what you pray for. Yes, sir. Well, you know. Yeah. And I want him to control me as I go through life, you know. So every day yeah. when I get up in the morning, I say that prayer. If you if you say it from your heart, that's one thing. That's what I'm doing. Yeah, if you're saying it from your heart, then it's not vain. See, he didn't say don't use a repetition. 
But, but what if you just do it? Oh, it's seven o'clock. I've got to say the Lord's prayer. No, that's that would be vain. But if you're but if you're actually talking to God, you are my Father. Help me to hallow your name. You put it in your own words, or you can say those exact words, but you put it in your own words. I start my prayers in the car in the morning. Good morning, Father. Yeah. Good that's morning. How I start my yeah. prayers on my way to work in the morning. What's the scripture reference for the definition of kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy? Uh, chapter fourteen and verse seventeen, I believe it is, of Romans. Yeah. Yeah, I've got Schofields on the left page, left column. Easy to find. <laughs> Everybody needs to get Schofield, so they'll have that. The original Schofield. Okay, um, so he said, pray thy kingdom come. But that means in my life. Jesus said, this is something that a lot of people just have a hard time with. He said in Luke 17, 21, he said, they said, when will it come? He said, well, when it does, it doesn't come with observation, for the kingdom of God is within you. And people have a fit with that. Oh, that's a mistranslation. No, it's not. One of the interlinears actually translated the word within as inside. The kingdom of God is inside you. Now let me very briefly, and I don't, I gotta quit here in just a few moments, but let me very, very briefly prove that to you. People say that word is mistranslated because it really means among you. Well, was there a world ruling kingdom among those handful of peoples? No, but there was the king. And this is what they teach us. Well, Jesus is the king, and he represents the kingdom of God, so he was among them. Oh, so Jesus is the kingdom of God. Okay, fine. Well, remember in, in John chapter 17, in Jesus' prayer to the Father, he said, I in them and they in me. Where is Jesus? He's in you. Is he the king? Yeah. Is he the kingdom of God? Yeah. Is the kingdom of God in you? I said that real fast. Let me say it again. If Jesus is the kingdom, and he's within you, where is the kingdom then? It's in us. Not the world ruling government, that's later. But the spiritual kingdom is either in you or you're not a Christian. If Christ is in you, the kingdom is in you. Another thing, too, the Greek word basileia means government. Jeremiah 31 31, I'm going to write my laws in their hearts. If God's kingdom laws are in my heart, if his government is in my heart, that's Bible, folks. I didn't make that up. I didn't write that in your Bible. So there is a literal kingdom, but there's also a spiritual aspect of the kingdom. And that's what we pray that will come in our life. Then he said, give us this day. By the way, oh, uh, let's see. I didn't read all that. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Well, now, if I pray that, does that mean everybody? Now, God's going to answer that prayer, and everybody in the world is going to start living righteously tonight. No, I doubt that. Based on Revelation, I doubt that. But his will can be done on earth where I'm concerned, where I treat you right, individual. I want your kingdom. I know he's, his kingdom won't come in, in everybody's heart today, but I want his kingdom, his government in my life so that God's will will be done where I'm concerned. So I treat you correctly. Now, I'm human. I may falter. And, but if I do, I'll repent and get up again and keep going. Thy will be done on earth in my life as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. That's interesting. I've had a guy, I don't know who he is, don't know his name. He comes around with a truck. He's got fresh bread, and he just gives me a couple of loaves when I come back. How many do you need? Give me two. It's not anything you ask for. It's not anything you subscribe. He just shows up, knocks on my door. It's not like the swine's truck. It's just a guy. Yeah, and I, and I asked him the first time he came. I said, is that day old bread? No, it's fresh bread. And I looked at the date, and it's the same stuff you get in the store, but he gave it to me. I mean, God knows how to give you stuff. Uh, you've heard that old, old, old story. But I'll tell you, because it's been a long time since you've probably heard it. <clears throat> this little old lady was, uh, this is back in the old days before they had screens. They didn't even have screens on the windows. And she was praying that God would send her bread. She didn't have any bread and she couldn't afford it. She's praying up a storm. Lord, please send me a loaf of bread. I don't have any bread. Give us our daily bread. I don't have any bread. And these two little hoodlums were outside listening to her pray. And uh, they said, let's play a trick on that old lady. We're going to go down to the store and get a loaf of bread. We're going to throw it in our window. So they did. They went and got a loaf of bread. And that woman still praying, oh, Lord, send me some bread. And they threw that loaf of bread in the window. And she started praising God and hallelujah and glory to God. And those kids just, just hollered out laughing. They thought they had made a fool out of her. And they said, lady, God didn't give you that bread. We did. She said, well... Maybe the devil brought it, but just the same, God sent it. <laughs> that's right, that's right. God knows how to, how to get your needs met. 
We haven't even got to verse 33 yet. Seek, it said, seek his kingdom in your life. Those needs will be met. Okay, so give us our daily bread. Now, I'd like to say, God, give me bread for the next 10 years. But he said, no, just pray that your daily needs will be met. Yes, sir. The Bible says the Lord ain't never seen his children begging for you. That's right. In the book of Psalms, David said, I was young, I'm old, and I've never seen the God of hungry. You may get free eggs. She knows a lady at her work gives me free eggs. Just. God can use anybody to bless you. We've got just a few more minutes here. Let's see if I can finish the Lord's Prayer. I might be able to finish that today. So after you pray for your daily needs, then say, and bread is symbolic. It doesn't mean just bread. You can pray for potatoes too, you know. Uh, but whatever your needs are. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, that is not talking about the debts you owe on your mortgage or the debt you may owe on your furniture or your car or on your credit card. It's not talking about that. Uh, the book of Luke, I don't have it written down here. Yeah, Luke 11, verse 4 is where it is. It says, forgive us our sins. That's how Luke reads it. Uh, forgive us our sins so that our debts are what we owe because of our sins to God. We, we are now indebted to God, as it were. So Luke eleven four says, "Forgive us our sins." That's what debts means. Forgive us our sins. Yes. Yeah, there's a little bit of a delay on Facebook, so his question is about bread. Is it okay? Is, is this bread? Does it mean the word of God? Okay, that's a good question. Does the word bread mean the word of God? Uh, you know, um, Paul told Timothy, rightly dividing the word of truth or rightly distributing. We can look at it that way. The word of truth. There's even a little magazine called Our Daily Bread, and it's referring to Scripture. So, yes, it could certainly, by extension, it could certainly apply to, to God, give me my daily spiritual bread. Some people call this soul food, you know. Give us our, our daily soul food. Yes, sir. Well, Pastor, you know, the, the, that bread means it takes in a whole bunch of stuff. Yes, it does. You get the word first in the morning when you get up. Yeah. And then if you need something to eat, the Lord gives you some bread to eat. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's right. There's about a 15 second delay, so that's why some of the questions. Some of the questions are because of the 15 second delay. Yeah, that's understandable. Now, he said, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. One of the verses, I think it's Luke says, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. I believe is the way it's worded. Trespass or sin is means the same thing as debts here. So, I want you to notice. We are not just say, Lord, forgive me, period. Lord, I want you to forgive me the same way I forgive those who sin against me. I've sinned against you. Remember the parable of the prodigal son? I have sinned against heaven. You pray this way, Lord, I've sinned against you, but I want you to forgive me the same way I forgive this man here or this man here. I want you to forgive me the same way I forgive them. And God's going to look at how you forgive your neighbors. He's going to look at how you forgive those who have hurt you. People say, well, yeah, but Keith, you don't know what they did to me. And no, I know what they're doing to you. They're keeping you from getting forgiven. What is it Joyce Meyer says about, you know, you're sitting there all mad and they're moving on with their lives. And yeah, they're not even aware that you're mad at them. Mm -hmm. Jesus is going to forgive you the same way you forgive others. Verse 14, if you forgive men their trespasses, your father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive men, he's not going to forgive you. Right. Yes, sir. We have to forgive others. Yeah. And, and verse 15 is scary. Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So that's what this verse means here in verse 12. Forgive us our debts the same way we forgive others. You say, well, how, what if I don't have anybody to forgive? You can practice it on the highway. Every time somebody cuts you off in traffic, say, I forgive you. <laughs> and start practicing it. Sow the seeds of forgiveness. Yes, sir. Well, you know, Yeah, uh, and he did say if you have, if somebody has all against you before you bring your gift to the altar, go and reconcile, try to get straightened out, and then bring your gift. So you I want to get. That's why he reminds us of things that we've done in the past. Yeah. So that we can ask forgiveness for those things, whether we can actually that person's even still here to ask forgiveness for. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, even if they're passed on or whatever. I think that's as far as we're going to get today. That was verse, uh, yeah. So uh, we'll come back. We'll start with where it says forgives for this next time, God willing. Uh, by the way, in class, we go through this all in about one night or two nights, you know, go through, speed through it. But here we can take our time to go through it very slowly. Uh, I would like for those of you who are in agreement with me about asking God to give me that uh, special, new, a fresh anointing for the radio broadcast, I'd like for y'all to, for those of you who'd like to, you don't have to, but if you'd like to, come up, just lay hands on me. I want one person to pray. Who would like to be the one to pray? Nobody wants to pray for me? Okay. <laughs> You'll pray for me. Okay. And those of you who would like to, you can come up, lay hands on me. And it can be a short prayer. Just say, Lord, give him an anointing and anoint the audience so that, that those broadcasts will produce fruit. Some courts to that effect. Thank you, sir. Or just, we'll do it right up here, I guess. And the anointing of the listeners. And, the, and to anoint the listeners, yeah. Yes. And, and you can, he'll just pray. We'll, we'll, we'll just have one person to pray. The rest of you can just be in agreement. Thank you for the word that's gone forth, Lord. And Lord, we ask, Lord, that we ask that you raise Keith up right now, Lord. I'm <clears throat> asking that you touch him in a special way, Father. Lord, continue to give him the insight, the knowledge, and wisdom, Lord, to continue to teach us, Lord. But more importantly, Lord, we raise him up, Lord, for a fresh anointing, Lord, as he gives the word to the world, Lord. Lord, we ask that you just open his mouth, Lord, work through him, Father. Lord, that he gives the word, Lord, with boldness, Lord. And Lord, that he gives it with, with, with accuracy and clarity, Father, that all may receive, Father. And that all may learn, Lord, and that all may be strong. Lord, be with us all, Lord. Bless our Sabbath today, Lord. Bless the listeners, Lord, that are on the Internet, Father. Lord, we send blessings to them, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank Amen. you, sir. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate right. that. You. Thank all of you. I appreciate it. All right. I'm Good glad to see you got the endurance to go 15 minutes. We need to hang the last one. Are we done? Are we done? So then I just tap.